down to redeem us. This morning, we're just here to say thank you. We're just here to say thank you for demonstrating your love towards us. God, you're so awesome. You're so wonderful. And we come back to say thank you. Now, God, I pray now that you would come and get involved with your word like only you know how to do. We understand that the entrance of your word give it life. And give understanding to the simple. We acknowledge that we are simpleton standing before a great and wise God. Now pour everything you would have into us this morning. God, that we can face this world with courage. We thank you for doing it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God some, a great big praise. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We thank God for our pastor. Pastors, Pastor Stephen and Yolanda Huntley. Come on, let's give God a praise for them. Praise God. Praise God. I want to call your attention quickly to the word of God, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. I'll be reading from the King James Version. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you need a minute, say wait a minute. All right, we're going to wait on you. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass them around about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know it. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews or muscle upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And I prophesied, as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the muscles and the flesh came upon them, and the skins covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then God said unto me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe unto these slain, that they may live. So again, I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto Ezekiel, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open up your graves. And I will cause you to come out of your grave and bring you back into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your grave. O oh, my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and ye shall put my spirit in you. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then ye shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, said the Lord. I want to talk this morning about trusting the powerful Word of God to lead. Trusting the powerful Word of God to lead. Over the last few months, Pastor Huntley has been in a series entitled The Powerful Word of God. 
Through this series, we have gained an appreciation for the fact that God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, according to the book of Hebrews. Yes. Often, when we hear the phrase, the word of God, that phrase get reduced to mean writings about God. That's good. That's good. Generally, when we refer to the word of God, we think of the Bible, a compilation of books, uh, uh, old and the new in a book that's bound by le leather we think of a book that should be revered and respected the Bible, the book is so respected in our society that when government officials get ready to be sworn in they'll place their hands on the Bible as they take their oath but, but let's be clear, when we talk about the powerful word of God, I do not want you to just relegate this to writings about God but, but I want you to think that the word of God is the same word that stepped out on nothing and said, let there be, and everything came to existence. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When, when, God got ready, when God got ready to create the earth, his words were so powerful that he didn't pick up a hammer or he didn't go to nails, but he just stepped out and he said, let there be, and everything came into existence. Yes, sir. His words are so powerful that the book of Hebrews declares that by faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God. Yes, sir. His words are so powerful that in the book of Psalms, when, when, when God talks about healing his people, he didn't have to go in and lay hands on his people. But the Bible says in Psalms 107 that he sent his word, sent his word. And, and in his word healed them yes, and sir. delivered them from their destruction. Th th that's why the enemy fights you every Sunday about getting to the house of God. Th ha have you ever noticed? That, that every Sunday, the kids can't find their shoes. The husband yeah, is yeah, crazy. Yeah. The wife is going crazy yeah. because the enemy is counting on the fact that you'll just throw your hands up and stay home. But I come to serve notice on the devil. I come to the house because I'm looking for a word from the Lord. I, I came because I know that there's something that's going to come out of God's mouth that's going to change my life. Anybody come just looking for a word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, Pastor, growing up, we would want to go to a basketball game on Saturdays, and, and my mom would say, he said, you can go to the basketball game, but before you go to the basketball game, I want to see your clothes laid out for church. And, and so me and my brother, we, we would try to get slick and we would bring up wrinkled clothes. And she said, no, 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 no. I don't want to see wrinkled clothes, but I want to see them ironed. She said, I want to see your socks. Because mama understood that one lost sock could stop you from getting to the house of God. And, and so to prevent all that, she would make us plan for the word of God. Why? Because God's word is powerful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God's words are so powerful, and when we say the word of God, we're talking about the same word that, that Jesus spoke when he stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus. Uh -huh. and, and Lazarus was in dead for a long time, and he was bound in grave clothes, but, but Jesus didn't have to go in and lay his hands on him, but he merely called Lazarus' name and said, Lazarus, come forth. Yes, sir. And the dead Lazarus had to get out of the grave. Why? Because there's power in God's word. His word. I heard one old preacher said that he had to call Lazarus by name because had not he called him by name, everybody in the grave would have got up because his words are powerful. God, God's words are so powerful that one day Jesus is walking by a fig tree and he's hungry and, and he goes to the fig tree because it looked like it was producing fruit and he went to pick figs off of the tree but he noticed that although it was bearing leaves there was no fruit yes, sir. and so the Bible says that Jesus cursed the tree and he went about his merry way yeah, yeah, when they yeah. came back the next day disciples the disciples looked at the tree and said Jesus isn't that the tree that you cursed? Yeah. And Jesus had to let them know that his words are so powerful that whenever God pronounces something over a thing, it's going to be whatever he said. Yes, sir. Conversely, if God has pronounced a blessing yes. over you, I don't care who come against it. If God puts a blessing over your life, they don't have to like it, they don't have to buy into it, yes. they don't have to promote it, but whatever God says, because God's word, God's word is powerful. God's word is powerful. 
Not only have we learned over this series that God's words is powerful, but God's words are powerful, but we've learned that God's words are true. Jesus is praying as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven right before he ascends and he's praying for his disciples in John chapter 17 and he looks up and he said, Father, sanctify them by your truth. By your truth. The next verse he says, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. We understand that God's word is truth. Yes, sir. God's word, whatever God says, it must come to pass. A few weeks ago, Pastor preached from Numbers chapter 22. And in Numbers chapter 22, he told us about the story of Balak and Balaam. Yes, sir. In Numbers 23, 19, the word of God says, God is not a man that he should lie. Yes. Nor is he the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Yes. He said, have he said it and will not do it? Have he spoken it and will not make it good? Yes, sir. He said, because my words are true. Yes, sir. So many times we're used to dealing with people who tell us one thing and do another and we approach our relationship with God with that baggage but God says you don't have to fear my word my word is true yeah, yeah, yeah. I love what one translation says one translation says because God is not a man he cannot lie oh, that's good. it's not that God God can lie and he chooses not to but he's incapable of lying incapable. why because his words are powerful I'm a man, I can lie. Yes. I, I can look at this, this, this shirt and I say, this shirt is blue, that's a lie. Yeah. But if God look at this shirt and say it's blue, this maroon shirt would have to start changing to become the blue shirt that he called it because God's word cannot lie. He cannot lie. He says, my word is truth. And as a believer, we have to live within the truth of God's word. There's this saying these days that said, live in your truth. Let me tell you, if you're a Christian, the only truth that you have is what the Word of God says. Amen. As a Christian, you cannot hold an opinion that is different than the Word of God. The word of God. To the extent that your reasoning and your thought does not line up with the Word of God, if you're going to be a Christian, Christian. you have to abandon your own opinion yeah. and say, Al although I don't understand it, God, I accept your Word, word. as truth. As truth. Truth. He yeah, says, yeah. my word is powerful and my word is true. Yeah. My word is true. Whatever God says is true. Yeah. And sometimes you have to speak the truth to the facts. That's good. F facts are things that exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. But truth never changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes you run up against these real spooky and deep Christians yeah. and, uh, who they think that having faith is, is mystical and, you know, they're coughing and they got water come out of their eyes and fling out of their nose and they say, I don't have this cold. Yes, you have a cold. <laughs> Sorry to tell you, you have a cold. Be 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 because we, we don't have to deny the facts right, right. to keep speaking the truth. There you go. And the, the, the facts may be that, that the sickness is unto death. Right. The, the, the facts may be that it's cancer in it's stage three. Yeah. But the truth of the word says by his stripes, right. I, I am healed. And so I have to just stay with the truth until the facts line up with, with the truth. Because God's word is, is truth. God's word is truth. And so as believers, we live by the powerful and the true word of God. We spend our lives with our ears inclined, waiting on God to say something to us. Because we understand that victory in this life is not based solely on grit, determination and hard work yes, yes. there are people who work hard for years right. and never reach the height of their expectations yeah, yeah. and so we cannot buy into this worldly mentality that I'm chasing the bag and I'm, I'm grinding it out because you can grind it out all you want to until you grind on what God told you to do yeah. it'll never come to pass That's good, preacher. And so the real measure of whether we, we will receive victory in any situation is dependent on one question. Did God tell me to do it? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the initial inquiry that we should make about any project. Did God tell me to do this? Yes, sir. Because if God told me to do it, I don't know what's going to happen in the middle, but all I know that if I pass through the fire, yes. it will not burn me. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but all I know, if I go through the flood, it will not overtake me because God told me to do it. Yes, sir. 
this is where most Christians get lost because the Bible addresses the big issues. Yeah, yeah. But there are these gray areas in life that the Bible does not specifically address. For example, whether you should move to Chicago or stay in Montgomery, there is no scripture that you will find that said, thou it shall move to Chicago and stay on the 105th floor right by the Wells Fargo. You're not going to see that in the scriptures. The scripture's not going to tell you who you should marry. Assuming that both of you all are Christians, that that's the, about the extent of what God would tell you in the scriptures, but, but, but you need God to say something specifically to you. And so most Christians get lost because they find it, it difficult to discern the specific word of God for my situation. Right, right. And so the question becomes, how do I learn to hear the voice of God so that I can know whether he's calling me to a specific place, area, or relationship? Yeah, yeah. In the word of, of Chris Cuomo, let's get to it. Amen. <laughs> The, the Bible uses two different Greek words to refer to the Word of God. The first word is logos, uh -huh. the logos. The, the Greek word logos mean word, uh -huh. reason, or plan. Uh -huh. In Christian doctrine, God's logos, or God's words, or written, or plan, is the Bible. Uh -huh. 66 books, 39 in the old and 27 in the new. The Bible is God's written plan of salvation, hope, and redemption for all of humanity. If you want to know God's logos or God's general plan for your life, you can find it written in the Bible. Okay. It's the foundation for understanding the mind of God and the character of God. Mm -hmm. No one has ever seen God at any time. But if you want to know what God is like, just read his commandments. Uh -huh. Just read his commandments because his commandments reveals his character. Uh -huh. What do you mean? God doesn't ask us to do anything that he don't do. Yeah, that's good. So when he tells us in his commandments, thou shalt not lie, he said, the reason I'm telling you thou shalt not lie is because I'm not a man that I lie. That I lie. That's good. And the more you obey me, the more you look like me. Uh -huh. Because my word is God personified. Uh -huh. Logos is the foundation. And like anything, everything have a foundation. Uh -huh. Every house have a foundation. If you go and play a sport, every sport have fundamentals and foundations. But the thing about foundational things and foundations is that they're not fancy at all. Mm -hmm. How many of you, when you went to look for a house, you, you, you went in and you said, you know what, take me out, I, I want to see the foundation. Let me see your hands. <laughs> Come down here so we can pray for you, amen. <laughs> no, nobody goes to the house and say, I want to see a foundation. Uh -huh. There was a gentleman, I think, um, he played for San Antonio years ago called The Big Fundamental. Uh, and, and, and he wasn't the type of guy that you wanted to see at the All-Star NBA, you know, trying to dunk, contest, none of that. But he knew how to win games because he understood the fundamentals, yeah, the yeah, foundational yeah. things. Uh -huh. When you go look for a house, you go in and you look for a house and you're looking at the granite countertop and there's stainless steel and there's marble floors and there's hardwood. Oh, I like the house. Mm -hmm. But you can have a beautiful house with a defective foundation yeah, yeah, yeah. and the whole house would have to be condemned yeah. because the house is unfit to be lived in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the logos, the written word of God, is our foundation. Often we want God to speak to us specifically about purpose, where we should work, about relationships, but it's difficult to hear the specific word of God when you have not spent any time with the general plan of God, yeah. which is the logos. That's good. And so we walk away from church and say, well, church doesn't work yeah, yeah. because we don't want to spend any time with the, with the logos. I love what James says. He says, if any man looketh in the perfect law of liberty, that he should be blessed in whatsoever do it, whatever he do it. But he says, you have to continue in the word. In the word. You have to continue in the word of God. Yeah, yeah. And so as we continue in the word of God, God began to give us a point of reference for his voice. But if you spend no time with the logos, it's difficult to hear the specific. Uh -huh. It's almost like a, a person who says, you know what? I want to be a mathematician. Mm -hmm. I want to figure out all of these algorithms for uh, NASA to, to get us um, to, to the moon or to Mars or wherever President Trump is trying to take us. Praise God. Uh, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to be a mathematician. But they say, you know what? I don't want to sign up for Math 112. 
I, I want to do algorithms, but, but I want to skip over Math 112. Yeah. And if you're like me, you have Math 08, 098, yeah. no 099, yeah. praise God. Yeah. That was the remedial math for all of us that are slow. But, but you cannot get to algorithms yeah. until you figured out 112. 112, right. Because what the differential calculation professor knows is that when you get over here in specifics, I don't have time to be telling you that one plus one equal two. I, I don't have time to stop you and try to get you to figure out how to factor. When you get over here in specifics, you're gonna have to know the basic. And like that, God knows that when he starts showing you specifics, he's not gonna have time for you to be whining about criticism and haters. God don't have time. That, that's, that's math 112. Over here in specifics, you have to know something. Yeah. Preacher. Preacher. See, see, when you get over in the specifics of your, pur of your purpose, it's going to come with haters, it's going to come with critics, and God said, I don't need you coming to me complaining about that, because if you've been by the logos, you understand that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God shall deliver us out of them all. That's when you've been by logos. When you've been by the word, some things just don't bother you. And so, so God says, I, I, I want you to go back to Logos. Yes, sir. I want you to go back to Logos. When I left my parents' home in 2006, I made it a habit of going to Bible study. And I told my wife um, just a few weeks ago, I said, I've missed more Bible study in the last two years than I've missed since I left my parents' house. And one of the things that the Lord has been telling me, you better get back there. It's your lifeline. You better get back there. Yeah, yeah. I don't care who want to meet with you on Wednesday. You better get back there. Yeah. Because the word of God is your lifeline. Yes, sir. What happens is, is that as we read the word of God, you develop a, a sense of the character of God. And so when God starts speaking about specifics, you understand that God will never speak to me specifically about a thing that will contradict his word. Yeah, yeah. And so if somebody come up to me and I'm in a church service and some prophet come up to me and say, thus said the Lord, when I've been by logos, I understand I can judge what he's saying by the word of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can judge if the things that he's saying is true by the word of God. Why? Because I understand the character of God. Right. It, it's, it's like this. Me and my father, my father and I are very close. We talk at least two times a week. And I can almost with 100% accuracy tell you if my father said something. So if you came to me and said, your dad said that's why Z, I can pretty much tell you, no, daddy didn't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't there. Yeah. I didn't hear it. But I can tell you, daddy didn't say that because I know my dad. Right. Now, now you can tell me something else and say, yeah, that's him. He yeah. said that. He said all of that. Yeah. Why? Because I've spent time understanding him. Right. And so as we spend time in the general plan of God, the logos, we begin to understand God's character. And we're able to judge the specifics of what we hear. Right. We're talking about trusting God's powerful word to lead. Yeah, 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 yeah. The second Greek word that scripture used to refer to the word of God is rhema. Yes. Rhema is the revealed word of God that is given to an individual. And that word speaks specifically to your individual situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is John 2.5. You remember when Jesus went to the wedding and, and he, he and his mother went to the wedding and they ran out of wine and, and they looked to Jesus' mother and Jesus turned to him and said, Jesus, they're out of wine. Uh -huh. He said, woman, what does that have to do with me? Right. And she ignored everything he says and he looked down to the servant and she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Uh -huh. I don't know what he's going to tell you, I don't know. but he's going to say something. Yeah. And I don't know what he's going to say, but whatever he say, if you do it, you're going to get the miracle. Yes, and as a Christian, we live our life hungry saying, God, you got to say something. I, I don't know what you're going to say. I don't know when you're going to say it, but God, you got to say something. Have you ever been in a tight place and said, God, wait a minute, you got to say something. They land off on the job. God, you got to say something. This is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Because a non-Christian walk around thinking that they can figure it out on their own. A, a non-Christian walk around trying to figure it out with their own wisdom and their own degrees. But a believer stay in a place God said, okay, what are you saying? One of my mentors wrote a song that says, I won't make a move until you tell me. I, I won't speak a word until you give me what to say because I've tried so many things. 
Yeah. And many things have failed. Yes, sir. And so we live our life saying, God, what do I need to do? The rhema word will never contradict his logos. You don't ever have to worry about God speaking specifically to you about something that contradicts his word. God will never tell you that somebody else's spouse is your, your future husband. He'll yeah. never tell you that. Tell you. It's the enemy that's trying to convince you that that's of God. That is not of God. God would never tell you to go in the back room and do somebody dirty so you can get ahead. That's not God. God won't tell you that. And when you go by logos, you know that. Right. And so the rhema word is the specifics. Last week, as we were in Founders Day celebration, and they were up here on the stage, and I was thinking, God, look how much they've done, the, the founders done. And I was sitting there thinking, I got to do more. I, I got to grind harder. I, I got I to reach harder because I don't want to get to the end of my life and only buy a nice house or buy a nice car and take a few vacations. But God, I want to make a mark that cannot be erased. And, and, and they were sitting there and they were talking about all they've done that has manifested into all of us sitting into this building. Yeah. Started from 13. Yeah. And I was sitting there thinking, I got to do more, God, I got to do more. And then Pastor B asked uh, Miss McCree, she said, well, how did you know that Pastor Huntley was the one? How did you know that Pastor Huntley was the preacher to, to take you to the next level in God? And Miss McCree says, she says, God led him here. Yeah. She, she, says, she says, God let them here. We don't just come to a place uh, uh, out of our own thinking and out of our own planning and out of our own yeah. rationale. Yeah. We come to a place because God leads us yeah. to that place. Yeah. Yeah. And what we have to do if we have to trust that whatever we're going through in this life, that God is going to lead us where we need to be. You don't have to try to politic and cut people down. God is going to lead you right where you yes, need to be. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so God says, I'm, I'm going to lead you there, which turns us to our text in the book of Ezekiel. Just to give you some background information. There's a man that God calls out of Mesopotamia named Abraham. Abraham, have, God tells him that he's going to be blessed, and he's telling him that, that I'm going to use you in a mighty way. And so Abraham have a son who's named Isaac. Isaac then have a son named Jacob. Jacob names me trickster, supplanter, conniver. And one day he gets along with God and say, you know what, I'm sick of being this person. I need you to change me. He wrestles with God. God changes his name to Israel. And so now you got Ab Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Israel have 12 different sons. Those 12 different sons begin to have children who have children, and they become known as the 12 tribes of, of Israel. You know the story. They go through Egypt, and they come into slavery for many years. God sent Moses to bring them out of, of slavery, and then he takes them on to their promised land. When they get to their promise, or before they get to the promised land, Moses ha ha had went on the mountain, and he received the commandments for them. He received the Ten Commandments for them. When he got back down at the foot of the mountain, they had already broke, mo broken most of the commandments. And so he went back up to the mountain, and God gives him more commandments, and he come back down. They go through a period of time, and people die off, and the children of the people who first received the commandments are coming into adulthood. Yeah. And so in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses gives his second restatement of the law. He come down and he tells them the law again because they did not receive it from their parents. And so they are preparing to enter into the promised land. There are 10 tribes who goes and they take the northern part of yes. the promised land. Yes, Each tribe have a king. Yes. There are two tribes in the southern part of Israel, or the southern part of the promised land. Collectively, they are called Judah. The ten tribes in the north, as soon as they got into the promised land, they begin to decline away from God. Yeah, they yeah. begin to back away from the voice and the commandments of God. And so God would send prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah to tell them that if you do not hearken to my voice, I will give you over to your enemies. Yeah. Let, let me just put a pause right here because... I believe that God is a God of grace and God is a God of mercy, yeah. but let me tell you, God is also a God of wrath. Yeah. And God is also a God of judgment. Yeah. 
And he'll give you chance after chance after chance after chance. And when they would not hear God, God said, okay, I'm done. I will allow your enemy to take you into captivity. And so the ten tribes in the north get taken off into captivity. The two tribes in the south, which is Judah, they are kind of wishy-washy with God. They'll go back and forth. And, and, and so finally, God says, I'm sick of y'all too. <laughs> y'all acting like just like your sister tribe in the north, and I'm going to allow you to be taken away captivity. And there was a king there by the name of Joachim. In the year that Joachim ruled, God allowed the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to come and take them off into captivity. And so the prophet Ezekiel get caught up in all of this. He is a priest. He's obeying God. He's doing what God tells him to do. But how many know sin have consequences for everybody around him? Everybody around him. And so... Ezekiel get carried away into captivity with the children of Israel. Yeah, yeah. And here he is in captivity, living life, trying to give God praise, but he find himself trying to minister in the midst of bondage. Wow. And God keep telling him, you still got to minister. You still got to minister. Yeah. You still have to encourage them. You still have to tell them what thus said the Lord. Sometimes God will take you through some things and he would tell you and you still have to do what you're called to do. Yes, Just because you're going through does not negate the calling of God on your life. <laughs> H- have you ever had to encourage other people and walk home and go home discouraged? Have you ever had to tell people that God can and you walk away thinking, God, can you really? (laughs) And here is Ezekiel in the midst of bondage having to encourage the children of Israel. And we get to Ezekiel 37. And he said, and then the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the midst of of the valley which was full of dry bones. Here, look at the hand of God that is leading him where he's supposed to go. The hand of God, he said, the hand of the Lord came upon me and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the valley full of dry bones. It looked like a graveyard. Oftentimes, we think when the hand of the Lord come on you, that means I'm going to have prosperity. When the hand of the Lord come on me, I'm going to get a new job. I'm going to get a new car. I'm going to go on a better vacation. I can post about it. I can tweet about it. I can share it on Snapchat. But sometimes God would carry you to a place and you say, wait a minute, God, did you lead me here? And he's looking around and he's thinking, I knew I had a calling on my life, but God, did you lead me here? And God says, even in those tough moments, you have to trust that I am the Lord, and it was me that led you there. Yes, sir. God doesn't just lead you into places that are glamorous. Sometimes God will lead you to some desolate places. Yes, sir. And the hand of the Lord carried him yes. to the valley of dry bones. If you look in your own life, you have to ask, wait a minute, while I'm cursing this place, could it be that God led me here? Wow. C- could it be that the job that I complain about day in and day out, could it be that God led me here? Yeah, yeah. And God led him to the valley of dry bones. And I love what he says in verse 3. Verse 2, he says, there were many bones. All of them were dry. The third verse, he says, and he says, then God said unto me, if you could put that on the screen, then he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Ah. Now, I, I love this because before, before he give him the question, he kind of prefaces it with, with, with what God knows the answer is. He said, son of man, uh-huh. can these bones live? When he called him son of man, he was acknowledging that he was limited in his wisdom wow. because he's the son of God. Right. And the son of God is omniscient. The son of God knows all things. Yeah. But when he says son of man, he said, look, I know you don't know, but son of man. Uh-huh. Can these bones live? And I love Ezekiel's answer. E- e- Ezekiel answered really good. He says, Lord God, you know. I, I don't want to offend you, God, but, but you can tell Ezekiel is having some doubt here. He yeah. said, God, I don't really know because this looked bad. Yeah. And sometimes God will lead you to places that look bad. Yeah, look bad. And he answered it. He said, oh, Lord God, thou knowest. 
And he said, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy. Prophesy. Edify, comfort, and exhort these bones. And say to them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, to a carnal man, this looked foolish. This looked foolish to be out there prophesying to bones. Yeah. To, to a carnal man, people would tell you, child, I would have left that house a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And to a carnal man, to a carnal man, people would say, I don't see why you're still putting up with this job. But God says, I led you here and you don't get to walk away when you want to walk away. You walk away when I say walk away, yeah. prophesy to the bone. Oh. <laughs> and so he said, he said, he told me to prophesy unto the bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Yeah. And I will lay muscle upon you, and bring up, bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And I love verse 7. He said, so I prophesied as I was commanded. I love this because you can see the reluctance. You, you can see that he, can, he he's not real sure whether it's going to work. And I'm not prophesying because I believe it, but I'm prophesying because he commanded it. And if you would just go and start saying what God says. If you would go and start saying what God said. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but because he told me to prophesy, I'm going to prophesy. Yes, sir. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. He said, as I prophesy, something happened. You keep waiting on something to happen before you prophesy. But God said, if you would, by faith, begin talking what I said to you, you're going to see something happen as you prophesy. And he said, as I prophesy, stuff start coming together. I, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but God said, this is the season that I'm going to cause things to come together. The things that been disconnected, things that been disjointed, I'm going to cause it to come together. together. Yes, sir. This is what I love. The prophet didn't have to go down and start picking up bones and say, okay, this looked like a femur. This looked like a, okay, I don't know what that is. He didn't have to do all of that. He didn't have to work at all. All he had to do was prophesy. And, and whoever you are, God said, just start prophesying. Just look at it and say, you will live. You will live and not die. So he said, as I prophesied, as I was commanded, there was a noise and behold a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, when I looked up, I saw that muscle had came up on the thing. Yeah, yeah. He said, not only did the bones come together where it was standing up like a skeleton, but he said the muscles started coming on it. He said, it got the strength to do the things that it need to do. God said, if you keep on prophesying, not only will it stand up, but you're going to have influence. You're going to have the ability to get the things done that you, you're going to get some muscles. Yeah. Yeah. He says, the sinews start coming upon it. We'll bring up, and the flesh start coming upon it. He said, but there was no breath in it. No breath. And I love this. He said, then said he unto me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man. I, I, I'm going to read that again. Yeah. He said, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man. Now, if you wasn't raised in the church, this doesn't really mean a whole lot to you. Yeah. But, but when you go down to the country and preach, they talk back to you when you preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and when you really start preaching, they'll say, preach, part preach. And this is what God was doing. He said, prophesy, son of man. Prophesy. You're doing something that's working. Keep on prophesying. And when you keep on prophesying, everything that you've been praying for is going to prophesy, son of man. Prophesy. God said, you've been working and you've been thinking that you're working for nothing. But God sent me to tell you, prophesy, son of man, prophesy. Go with your bad self. You're doing things that it may not look like anything now, but if you keep on prophesying, I hear the Lord saying, though your beginning be small, your latter end shall be greatly increased. Prophesy, son of man, prophesy. He said, I start, I start prophesying. And then my help came. 
and God started encouraging me. You may be in the middle of trouble and it looked like nobody's around you to encourage you. It looked like you have to pick your own self up. But God said if you would get started in the middle of the night, I'll start singing songs over you. And you'll wake up in the morning with a little bit more pep in your step. That's just God saying prophesy, son of man prophesy. He said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, thus said the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe unto these slain, that they may live. He says, now I'm going to tell you to prophesy to the elements. Now that you got a little bit more courage by yourself, there's no need to stay in these parameters. There's no need to talk it just the bones. Now you need to prophesy to the wind. You've been talking to bones long enough. Now it's time to prophesy to the wind. God said, this is the time that you quit uh, lowering your level of expectation. You don't just have to stay in a valley prophesying the bones, but I'm calling you to say to wind, come here. He says, talk about the powerful word of God that led me to these bones, that led me to this marriage. I'm talking about the God that led me to this job. He didn't bring me here just to complain. He didn't bring me here just to murmur. He brought me here to prophesy because he knew that there were people here that was waiting on me to speak the word of the Lord. So I prophesied. And he said, as I prophesied, breath came into them. And he said, it stood up on their feet. And I love this. He said, it was an exceeding great army. It started as a valley of dry bones, but when I got finished speaking the word of God to it, not only was it a skeleton with muscle, but it was a great army. God said, you have more than you think you have, but it's waiting on you to prophesy to it. You have way more than you think. You think everybody else have more than you. And God, I'm just doing the best I can with what I got. But if you start prophesying to it, it's going to stand up and it's going to be a great army. It's a great army. I said it's a great army. It's not small, it's a great army. Everything you need is in the house. Everything you need is in the house. And if you would just start prophesying to it, it will live again. A great arm. This is for the people who've been walking around with the mealy mouth, saying that everybody else got more than me. You know, they smart. They went to college. That's why they got that. Let me tell you, you got the word of God in you. If you start prophesying, God said, I will cause you to take over things. I'll let you come in the company and you'll be running it because you prophesied. He says, now that I showed you what you have and you prophesied and you see you got this big old army behind you. He said, now go tell Israel that I'm going to cause them to stand up just like this army. I know they think they're feeble. I get it. I know they think they're weak. I get it. I know it don't look like much. I get it. I know it looks desolate. I understand. But tell them that they have an exceeding great army and the Lord is going to do battle on their behalf. God led this prophet to a valley because he knew that there was something there, but it needed to hear God's word. Let me ask you, where have you been called to? that is waiting to hear the word of the Lord. Where, where, where have you been called to that's waiting to hear the word of the Lord? What relationship have you been calling to that, that people are telling you just walk, walk out on it? God said, I promise you if you speak to it and speak to it and keep speaking to it, it's going to stand up. It's going to stand up. Year after year, it's going to stand up. If you keep doing what I told you, it's going to stand up. God says, I'm leading you to a place. You're not just here because you just so happen to be here. 
you're not just in Montgomery because I just figured I'll come to Montgomery. God said, I led you here. I brought you here. And if I brought you here, I will sustain you here. For some of you, the word of the Lord is, keep quit trying to look for somewhere else to go. I brought you here. For some of you, he's saying, get off the internet looking. You're not going anywhere. I brought you here. And so while you're here, you might as well prophesy. Amen. Might as well prophesy. Might as well prophesy. You know, I'm closing. One of the things that the Lord has dealt with me on we can get so caught up into the culture of this world that says, I got to grind it out. I got to work. I got to do here. And we go in here and go in there. But God says, I know where I'm taking you. I want you to just slow down. It's okay. It, 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 trust me, you're going to get there. But I'm leading you there. And if you can trust me, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't even heard it haven't even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared. But every now and then, he'll reveal it to you. Every now and then, he'll give you a little glimpses. He'll show you here and there, look there. One day, it's going to stand up. Maybe you're here this morning, and you've been in a, what seemed like a valley of dry bones. And the spirit of depression and heaviness has tried to come and just overtake your life. He said, I don't think I can come out of this. This morning, you can come down to this altar. We don't have a special prayer, but we will connect our faith with yours. And we'll let you know that you can make it if you keep on prophesying. The altar is open this morning. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. You've never experienced him. This morning you can come down to this altar. It shall live again. That's it. Wonderful Lord. Wonderful Lord. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. Wonderful. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. 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 You can come to the altar. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. For the spirit of heaven is the garment of praise. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. 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 Speak, Lord, speak
may continue on the altar. Let's stand all over the building. There are some special guests out in the vestibule area. If you could just stop and love on them and hear their platform, we would, we would appreciate if you do that. Amen. Lift your hands for the blessing. Now may the Lord God bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord empower you and cause peace to be in your house. May the Lord cause enemies to fall at every side that come to attack you. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, present your faultless before his presence with exceedingly great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good rest of the week. Lord, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, speak.